uh, thank you for coming. Uh, that's me, that's my email address and my Twitter handle. If you want to contact me at any point in time, I now work for a company called Xamarin uh, that uh, whose sole purpose is to advance the use of mono and C-sharp on every possible form or shape. And uh, we've always been very excited about the, the uses of mono and C-sharp in the game world. So I'll talk a little bit about, about what we've done in the game world. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, who is using mono uh, for games. I'll give you some, uh, some, some direction and some hints on what you should do if you're building video games based on the experience that, uh, that we had in the past with, uh, with various people building games. And finally, um, I would like to tell you about what, what we regard as one of the most exciting, uh, most exciting features of, of Mono and C-Sharp in the gaming world, uh, which uh, we believe is going to revolutionize the way that you think about, uh, about writing your games. So we'll talk about that at the end. Um, so anyways, to, let, let's get started. Um, some of you might not know very much about Mono, so I'll give just a very quick overview of what it is. Uh, Mono is an open source implementation of Microsoft's .NET framework. And, uh, and being open source has a couple of interesting attributes. Uh, one of them is that we, we manage to port Mono to a variety of operating systems and devices. Uh, this is just a nice wall of the different uh, environments and operating systems where you can run uh, Mono today. It's missing an Xbox 360, and uh, and I guess and, and I guess I need to put an image there, but um, but you're gonna have to forgive me for the oversight for now. But basically, you can run Mono on pretty much anything today, uh, from popular iPhones and iPads to Android devices to PlayStations to Xboxes to the Wii, and to the main desktop computing platforms, uh, Mac, Windows, and Linux. And Linux was in fact uh, the origin of Mono. Mono was created. Uh, initially uh, because of our passion for the Linux operating system. But, um, but that is not the subject of this talk. I'm not going to talk about those things. Um, I'm going to talk uh, very specifically about a few platforms. And, um, and although Mono supports a variety of languages, um, it can run JavaScript, it can run Java, it can run Ruby, Python, F Sharp, and, uh, and a plurality of other research languages, our focus really is on C Sharp just because it's the language that is the best supported in terms of uh, what you can get out of an IDE, is the one that you'll find on every possible platform, and uh, is the one that, that you'll be able to leverage everywhere. So we're gonna we're gonna have to basically trim out a lot of the a lot of the a lot of the talk to just focus on a few areas. Now let me show you a couple of examples that have been built with Mono. Um, the Sims 3, it's a pretty popular game. Um, I went uh, a couple of days ago to fetch the uh, the image uh, to fetch some screenshots from The Sims, and uh, what started as a as a couple of products now has exploded into all sorts of packs, including a Katy Perry uh, pack. I had no idea that existed. I only bought the original one, and I have um, actually never played any of the add-ons yet. But uh, what is interesting about this code base is the engine, the graphics engine, what drives a lot of the a lot of the simulation is actually written in C and C++. But the scripting and the AI and a lot of the user interface elements were actually developed by a team of C# -sharp developers, um, and um, and they were one of the very early adopters of uh, of uh, Mono and C#. -sharp. They uh, the development took place mostly in Visual Studio. Uh, because at the time that this port was done, uh, Mono was still in its infancy. Uh, it didn't have, um, there was not really uh, an IDE like exists today with Mono Develop, um, and uh, and Mono was a lot smaller project, was a uh, very tiny project when they started using it. They initially did the port for x86, and later on they brought in uh, they, they brought in uh, the Sims to PS3 and Xbox 360. Um, another different uh, look at the problem is, um, is Bastion. Bastion is a game that was uh, written in C Sharp using the XNA framework from Microsoft. And uh, I, actually, I actually never played this on Xbox. I didn't know about it until recently. But uh, what was interesting about, uh, about Bastion is that it was actually ported, um, it was actually ported to run inside Google's Chrome's uh, native client. Native client is a technology that lets you run uh, native code, uh, C and C++ and C Sharp code, um, with a minimal performance penalty in a sandbox environment. So this allows you to run 
unsafe applications that you can download from the internet in your machine at native speeds uh, built with native compilers uh, without having to worry about the uh, about malicious code being downloaded and bastion one was was one of the of the test cases uh, that uh, that that Google showcased recently when they launched uh, native client to the public. What is interesting about uh, about this port is that they actually had to port Mono. Mono's uh, virtual machine and execution system had to be ported over to native client. It had to behave. Uh, it had to uh, to abide by the rules of the uh, the Google Chrome uh, security sandbox. And uh, all of this work was done by Google, and uh, they contributed those changes back to Mono. Uh, the Bastion games took an earlier version of Mono game, and which is this XNA implementation, and uh, and they ported it to to run inside the sandbox environment that Google Chrome provides. It is interesting because you can you can run it uh, directly from the Google Chrome App Store, and um, as a long-term Linux um, Linux lover, um, it was fascinating because it was the first time that we could get this um, high-quality um, games that had built with Mono. Uh, back into the platform that, that we loved. So you can actually run the same binary across all three platforms, Mac, Windows, and Linux. It's a very interesting example. And, uh, and I hope that they talk more about, the, about their efforts and their development uh, methodology for, doing, for bringing the port over. Then uh, we have other examples. Uh, this in particular one is, uh, is Soulcraft. Soulcraft is, what is interesting about Soulcraft is that Soulcraft didn't Write a single line of uh, C or C++ code, which tends to be the uh, which tends to be the norm in the gaming world. Uh, it tends to be that most game engines are written uh, in a low-level language, and uh, and the AI is actually built using a high-level language. In this particular case, uh, in this particular case, the entire engine is written in C sharp, and it was designed in this way so that the same code could be used on uh, on sandbox environments, like for example Windows. Uh, on the Windows Phone 7, uh, so it can run also inside Windows RT without having to link with any native libraries. Um, it runs on Android, on iOS, on Macintosh, and Windows, uh, and it's all it's all pure C sharp code. Uh, all they use is the underlying uh, the underlying graphics libraries like OpenGL uh, for rendering these into the screen, and I assume DirectX on uh, on Windows. Um, so this is a very interesting. Uh, it's a very interesting effort for 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 that reason. Also, uh, the Delta Engine was recently open sourced, uh, so you can actually also build uh, games using Delta Engine. It's a little bit different than XNA. Uh, it's their own uh, set of uh, APIs, uh, but it might it might be useful for some of you. Finally, there's uh, Unity 3D, which is the industry sweetheart. I don't think anybody, uh, probably nobody in this talk. Uh, uh, will be surprised. Um, Unity has is one of the most popular game engines today. Uh, it uses a, a more traditional approach uh, to delivering the goods. The engine itself is written in C and C++ and they use Mono as an embeddable uh, as an embeddable scripting language. We'll talk more about that um, uh, ahead but that is a model that they use and uh, it is a fascinating uh, technology because it's not really a it's not really just a platform. Uh, they come full with a designer. Uh, it's basically uh, it's basically a game developer uh, toolkit that has everything that you need. Um, you don't you really don't need to go anywhere else. Uh, you can get all of your goods directly from Unity. It's um, it is pretty interesting because you can use C# -sharp to either uh, provide the game AI or your game object logic, or you can use it to extend Unity itself. You can extend the the editor itself uh, using Mono and C#. -sharp. The, um, they're very, very popular. Um, thousands of games on, on all of the, of the modern app stores are powered by Unity, and, uh, and, they, and they recently launched a Flash translator that translates their C, C++, and Monocode all over to Flash bytecode, and you can even run these inside a Flash a virtual machine. And they were, also, uh, they were also part of the Google announcement for a native client where they showed uh, that you could also target uh, native client applications and target all three platforms at once uh, with Chrome. So very interesting use case. And the last one of the use cases that I want to talk to you about today before we get into the meat of the talk, oh no, the, 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 there's one more, uh, it's Second Life. 
Uh, Second Life, it's a it's a virtual it's a virtual reality world. Uh, you use a client. The client is written entirely in C or C plus plus. It doesn't contain any mo any monocode. But what is interesting is that users are able to attach behavioral scripts to multiple uh, to various components that they design. So it's it's an environment designed to create content and uh, and to attach scripts to this content. Uh, the the language that they use it's a uh, it's historically it's it's a historical language that they created for their own use called LSL, and uh, and LSL was a scripted language. It was fairly slow, and they turned to Mono when they needed to boost the performance of um, of their servers. They wanted their servers to either host more features, host more worlds, or execute the code faster, and be able to to hold more uh, tenants in uh, or more effects in a single world. Um, the the numbers of the performance boost you can Google them up. Uh, I think that right now they're up. Uh, they claim that it's 200 performance boost over the original LSL scripts. What is interesting about this is that uh, you upload code to the server and they run the code on your behalf. And what is interesting about what they do is that they actually uh, rewrite your code. Uh, they inject code into it to make sure that they can at any point during the execution of your script they can serialize your script to a database. And re uh, and reincarnate it in a separate server, allowing uh, allowing the code to basically move from one server to another as you cross into the multiple worlds in Second Life, and you can keep your state as you go. So it's a very interesting example, and uh, and there's uh, there's plenty of material online that you can see about the technology that they uh, uh, the technology that they use to make this happen. And finally, this is the last example: Infinite Flight. It's a it's a flight simulator. Uh, the targets um, the targets uh, mobile devices and uh, it's a subject of the second part of this talk and uh, I've seen the slides and they're fantastic so you should stick stick around to, to the second part it's really really interesting stuff and it's built using mono game and you'll learn a lot about uh, about mono game and and how they uh, contributed to this effort to make it happen so anyways uh, let's move on and let's discuss why people uh, have chosen mono in the past and um, and um, there are multiple answers, and it really depends on who you ask. They range from uh, from Mike Acton doesn't scale, uh, meaning that you can't really hire clusters of Mike Actons to make your games happen, or you don't necessarily uh, can afford uh, you know 20 Mike Actons to work in your project. Um, so that's one reason. Uh, but uh, some uh, more realistic reasons are that uh, life is just too short. Life is just too short to debug another memory leak. Life is too short to track another memory corruption bug, or, or you just as a person deserve better. And um, and what happens typically uh, with games is that uh, what needs to take place is a quantitative analysis of where what what your game is doing. And sometimes uh, you're going to be running on constrained environments like a, like an Android device or an iOS device, and there's only so much power that you can use. So you might want to use as as much code uh, in C or C++. You might want to put as much work into the GPU, um, and um, and you might need to 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 do some trade-offs as to what your game does. But um, eventually, um, eventually, it's not very productive to write everything in a low-level language, and particularly when it comes to designing fun or quickly iterating over what would be fun or how to change the dynamics of the game. Uh, you soon run, uh, you soon find out that low-level languages are not ideal for prototyping, and they're definitely not ideal for uh, uh, for quickly changing the mechanics of the game without introducing errors, without uh, uh, without crashing your application, and without wasting um, large chunks of your life on it. Um, it also happens that sometimes uh, people working on the engine are not necessarily the same people that are working on the on the gameplay. And uh, the people working on the engine, uh, you know, they're professionals like like Mike Acton or Linus Torvalds. Uh, they know everything about locking, about threading, and uh, and they can and from the top of their head they can tell you how many cache misses there are in a in a structed reference. But uh, but those are not necessarily the same guys that are thinking um, how much power you need to drain from an enemy and how to keep it fun. And those guys don't necessarily need to count cache lines, and those guys probably want to focus in a higher level language. So basically, uh, 
for many years, there's been this struggle between uh, using system languages or using scripting, scripting languages. And system languages are great for if you need to get good control of the hardware, if you need really to speak to the machine, and if you're accounting for every possible cycle. Uh, but the problem, as I said, is, uh, is you end up wasting a lot of time on this. Um, in fact, Mono itself grew out of our of our own experience building, not, not even games, we're building uh, desktop applications for Linux. Uh, back in 2000, uh, we had a little startup that was focused on Linux on the desktop. And uh, we spent hours uh, trying memory corruption bugs. Uh, we used this tool called Purify and, uh, and Ensure that were tools that helped us track down memory leaks and memory corruption problems and hard to debug C and C++ problems. And uh, we just wasted way too much time on that. We wasted, um, we wasted man months just tracking down uh, these problems that were affecting our users and corrupting the program. So, um, so we always wanted to, to use a higher level language. And uh, you know, today it's, uh, it's kind of a granted uh, that high level languages like JavaScript are incredibly productive. They're easy to write. And uh, uh, you never crash Chrome uh, because you did something dumb in JavaScript. Well, I'm sure somebody in the audience has done it. But in, in general, you have. Uh, Scripting languages are very good for productivity, um, but they're pretty slow. They're pretty slow compared to native code. And uh, this is a discovery that actually uh, Mr. John Osterhout, um, who, uh, who actually can be uh, credited for a lot of innovations uh, that today we take for granted at Berkeley did. Uh, he was one of the early proponents of scripting languages. This comes from a paper, uh, from, a paper from 1998. Um, and, and this comes after years of, of John actually pitching this idea of using scripting languages to increase uh, developer productivity. Uh, he used to refer to this as raising the programming level. And, um, and he was pitching at the time his own scripting language called Tickle. But um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this chart, but the, uh, uh, you can look at the slides online later. Um, and you can actually read the paper that is referenced at the bottom of this slide later as well. But the findings uh, were very impressive that they could shrink down development times in orders of magnitude. And you can see some of those samples in this slide itself. Um, now what happened with John, uh, what happened with John's prediction is that you have to remember that, uh, that this paper was published in 1998. So he was, he, was, uh, he was ahead of his time. He was ahead of his time and uh, you have to remember that John was working around this time from 1998. Uh, four to 1998, 1992, um, he was working with some high-end uh, hardware at the time, Spark computers, HPPA computers, uh, but nothing, none of these, uh, none of these things were actually suitable by uh, with the hardware of the time. I just want to remind you what the uh, desktop computers in 2000 looked like at the time. Uh, people had to use C and C++ not because they wanted, but because that was really the only thing they they could afford. Um, let me just give you a couple of, uh, of data points. Windows 2000, the requirements for Windows 2000 were 133 megahertz or more. Uh, they requested 64 megs for the desktop, 256 for the server. Uh, my iPhone has, has four times or eight times more memory than, this, uh, than these configurations. Um, the CPU frequency is much higher. It's an order of magnitude higher than, than was required uh, 12 years ago. Windows XP uh, came out a year later, and the requirement, they really bumped up that requirement to something beefier. They wanted people to use a beefier computer. So they requested 233 megahertz. Not even the first iPhone was running that slow. And, uh, and this is my memory probably failing me, but I seem to believe that in 2000, when we launched our little startup, uh, the best computer we could get for our engineers was around the one gigahertz mark. And I believe we were roughly around a gigabyte worth of memory, but um, I might be wrong on this one. So anyways, what it's important to remember is that scripting wasn't really suitable back in the day. Um, it is also the year that Microsoft introduced C-Sharp for the first time. And uh, C-Sharp 1, uh, C-Sharp 1.0, 1 as many of you might know, uh, was a Java-like system. It, it drew a lot of concepts from Java, type safety, garbage collection, uh, help higher level um, higher level programming constructs uh, and this focus on giving the developer focus on uh, you know raise the programming level and focus more on the problem at hand than on the details of how it's done so C# 1.0 was very much like a Java system 
and uh, and uh, it hit the sweet spot because, uh, like I said, the computers of the time couldn't really run scripting languages comfortably. You just didn't have the memory, and you just didn't have the CPU power. Um, so C# -sharp was actually designed uh, for the systems of this time, and. Uh, what they did is uh, they had the benefit of having worked with Java for a long time, and uh, Microsoft had their own J JVM, and it was probably one of the fastest performing JVMs of the time. But there are things fundamentally difficult to optimize or compile for in Java. So when they built C Sharp, they actually uh, tried to fix a lot of the problems in Java's design. And I might have exaggerated with 10 years of experience there. It might be less than that. But um, they found that there were things that were very, very complicated to optimize for or required too much memory uh, to properly optimize or required too many CPU cycles to actually do a, an efficient JIT compilation of this. Um, so these things are not necessarily the, uh, a problem today with modern Java VMs where you have gigabytes of memory to throw at the problem. But, uh, but back in the day, it made a big difference. So for example, all methods in C Sharp, they're not virtual. Um, in Java, they're always virtual, which means that every call was basically delayed uh, because you had to do a dereference because before you could make a method invocation. C# -sharp changes that to have everything be a direct call, uh, except in cases where uh, you actually want to opt into object-oriented programming with virtual methods. They introduce structs as opposed to just having objects. Uh, this is why integers are so cheap in C# -sharp compared to Java. Um, it helps the garbage collector. Uh, you create fewer objects, and uh, you don't necessarily need to box these objects to keep them in collections. Um, they added support for easily binding native libraries, so you could directly call uh, system libraries and, um, without having to go and write some glue code like you had to do with Java and GNI. And they introduced delegates, um, and the delegates are a fascinating mechanism. It's basically a type-safe uh, function pointer. And they are the foundation for Lambda programming and functional programming in C-sharp. So that's one thing that Microsoft got right very early on. So basically what happens is that um, it was a fairly interesting programming language, and we were very excited about the, this blend of performance uh, and productivity. So it's not exactly as performant as, as hand-tuned C or C++ code or assembly language, uh, but it gave us a lot of the productivity of a fully dynamic language. Not necessarily all of the productivity, uh, but it got us very close. So it was a very interesting choice uh, for us working back on Linux desktop back then. Now, you care about this because uh, you're certainly going to have a blend of, uh, of this C and C++ code, and you're going to have a little bit of a blend of uh, your C Sharp and Java code uh, in your code. And, um, and uh, you'll have to make a balance of where you're spending your cycles and how you make this division. So, uh, you know, as game developers, you have to worry about a lot of things. I, I, I sometimes equate uh, building a game engine and a, and, a, and, a, and, uh, and in a game to actually building an operating system. It might be just as complicated. Uh, or building a compiler. There's so many interlocking pieces. There's so many interlocking pieces in a video game that it's, um, it is pretty impressive. You have to worry about the entire uh, display uh, engine, making sure the frames are on time, displayed on time, that it feels smooth, that you keep your user engaged. You have to do things that are not programming related. You have to, uh, you have to think about the psychology of the thing, creating a mood about your game. Uh, there's that whole universe of problems over there. Then you have to worry about your simulation, your physics, collision detections, showing particles, simulating fires, all those things. Uh, then you add your game logic. Uh, how is your game going to behave? What should you do when you hit somebody else? Um, how should the enemies chase you? How hard should they chase you? How, how good or, or dumb these enemies are? Um, you need to control how the camera behaves, how it spins around, uh, what happens when an enemy hits you, that sort of thing. And then you have to, uh, you have to deal with, uh, on top of all these problems, <laughs> you have to, uh, to add some music to your, to your game, and, uh, and you need to become an expert on audio and music and mood setting. Uh, you have to deal with the user moving his, uh, his mouse, his controllers, his six-axis controllers, uh, or tilting his device. And to make things more interesting, you might want to make uh, this a network game, so you need to be coping with data coming in from the network. And the problem, as uh, probably everybody of, of you know here, is that you basically need to do all of this at once. Um, so it's not, uh, you can't really do one, uh, you can't really split this as you're doing everything at once. So it's a very complicated problem. 
So you need to respond to user input, you need to run your AI to update the scene, and then you need to uh, render your graphics. And you don't really have a lot of time to do this. Uh, things get even worse when you actually have to do this on a mobile device and you're trying to sell your game or you know, distribute your game on, for iOS and uh, on devices running at 600 megahertz. So there's a lot of things in your plate uh, that are happening at once. So, um, so that's a little bit of the challenge. And uh, historically, a lot of people had used uh, scripting languages. Uh, there are some very easy scripting languages to embed, uh, things like Lua, Python, or roll your own scripting language. Um, so all of these game logic uh, historically was, uh, was pushed up to be done on a scripting language. Um, and the idea was, uh, and the idea is that the people actually working on the front part of the problem uh, would be working in a high level language. You couldn't really trust your, uh, your game experience people to, uh, with malloc and free, and they probably didn't know the difference between a destructor and a virtual destructor. So you, uh, so you kept those guys isolated in the script world, uh, but you take care of everything else. You wrote everything else in C, C++, assembly shared languages. And uh, the trend that we're seeing now, and where, you know, what I am personally passionate about is replacing the scripting language with C Sharp. Um, and, uh, and the only reason is because I think that it's a, it's a good blend of performance uh, and high-level programming. Now, I just mentioned that, uh, well, right, one, one last thing uh, before I move on. So, again, C Sharp is not perfect. It will not give you the same performance as, uh, for example, Intel's uh, C++ compiler. Uh, we're not there. Uh, but it will get you very close. It will get you to uh, between 50 and 80% of native performance. And I'll give you a few hints of how you can get there. So it is important that you keep in mind uh, uh, that you still do a balance and you still uh, understand where your CPU cycles are going to and what are your actual requirements and what's your budget for scripting. Uh, we think that we can, we can give you a much larger budget for your AI if you use C Sharp for your AI than if you use a scripting language. And, uh, and although C Sharp is a safe execution environment, uh, like I've been making the case so far, I'll tell you how you can shoot yourself in the foot later in the talk. Um, so don't do it, and uh, my cheat people uh, asked me not to mention this, but we will because you guys are game developers, are game developers. Now, the last thing that I wanted to draw your attention to is that a lot of people tend to associate C Sharp with just a better Java, um, or just a, a Java with a slightly different syntax. And that was certainly the case with C Sharp 1.0. But over the years, uh, I mean, I've never seen uh, a language designer so engaged with his language for such a long period of time. You have to keep in mind that C Sharp probably started being developed in 1997. And Anders Helsberg, um, and Anders Helberg led the design up until its launch and continues to lead it today. And what I've always found fascinating is that Anders, uh, ever since 1997, this is uh, 15 years ago, he hosts a weekly language design meeting that lasts for four hours every uh, one, once per week. I think it's Wednesdays. Uh, so they spend some four quality, uh, four hours of quality time, figuring out how to design, how to extend the language, and how to, what things can go in and what things cannot go in. So um, he is an artist in that he knows when to say no and uh, uh, and which features he decides to adopt and which features he decides not to adopt. I've been pushing for years to get a long list of features that I thought would be interesting for C Sharp, just to have most of them turned down by. Uh, by the designers, and I think that they made the right call most of the time. Um, uh, and what we have is a very consistent, very clean language, very easy to understand. So they've added a lot of features over the years very tastefully. They did generics in the right way. They added iterators to the language. They added lambda functions. Um, probably one of my favorite features that they've added is, uh, is this new style of functional programming that they inherited from uh, from basically hiring a bunch of researchers and functional design people into Microsoft. So Microsoft Research uh, work on the f -sharp language and on OCaml and uh, people like Eric Meyer came and influenced uh, extensively the design of c -sharp 3. And they turned c -sharp 3 into a functional language and provided a lot of features and libraries that allowed people to develop functional style programming. Um, a lot of it had to do with delayed execution and the execution of code only on demand. Uh, and most importantly, it'll help people express their problems in terms of 
uh, well, writing software in, in terms that express the intent as opposed to expressing the steps. Uh, so a big focus of functional programming with C Sharp was instead of you know having loops of loops extracting data or sorting through data or, extra, or, or you know manipulating data or comparing arrays, sorting arrays, uh, instead you tend to describe what the intention is by using link queries and uh, you are much more precise into what the outcome of, uh, is that you want as opposed to what are the steps uh, to get that data out. So that was a big change in C-Sharp 3. Uh, dynamics extensions don't really matter for game developers, but the most exciting part, and, uh, and it's going to be the, 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 the section that I'm going to devote the most time at the end of the talk, is the synchronous programming and why this matters to game developers. So it is a language that is in constant evolution. Um, it hasn't uh, stood still. And you'll see that I've flagged C Sharp 5 as green, um, and that's because the language has not officially been released. You can use it today, uh, either using uh, Microsoft's compiler or our compiler. Uh, we have full, full support for async programming today, uh, but it hasn't been officially released. So you might expect some changes still in the feature in the feature set exposed by the compiler. Uh, so we're just waiting on Microsoft to rubber stamp it as ready. Uh, before we can call ours a full C Sharp 5 implementation, but as far as we know, we are complete and we even were complete before they were, so we're very uh, happy about that. So, let's uh, switch gears and talk about how would you use, uh, how would you use Mono in, uh, for building games or, or um, where does Mono fit really? So, um, so, the first thing that you need to realize about Mono is that while we're giving you effectively is a C-sharp language and a set of base class libraries that provide a lot of functionality for you. Math, string manipulation, uh, networking access, uh, asynchronous programming, uh, garbage collection, uh, functional programming, uh, big integers, complex data types, uh, uh, mapping to SIMD instructions in your platform. So if you run one of the supported platforms, we have uh, C-sharp intrinsics that allow you to, uh, to directly um, have your code generated into code that is processed by your uh, SEC instruction set or, uh, I mean, by your SEC processor. So um, that's what we give you. But we don't really give you a, uh, we don't really provide uh, something like Java run once, you know, write once, run anywhere. So Mono actually has a large collection of different user interfaces that you can use. On Mac, you can use Mono Mac. On, on Linux, you can use GTK Sharp. On, uh, on, on Windows, you can use Windows Forms. And uh, we haven't really provided a universal user interface system. Uh, we haven't even provided a universal audio system. Uh, different systems have different capabilities. And what we've tried to do is, uh, is to give you access to those routines in a platform-specific way. So you really should be thinking of Mono as a, uh, just as a high-level uh, language with, uh, with type safety, garbage collection, and all those features. But you shouldn't really be thinking of it as a, uh, as a particular toolkit for a particular set of libraries. Um, we're closer to C and C++ in that regard, in that uh, it's really your decision what you end up using. If you want to use um, a specific library that is cross-platform, good for you. Um, and we'll be happy to support you, but it's not really our intention. We try to support, for example, uh, the audio case is perfect. In Linux, audio is, uh, is, uh, is interesting, so we'll give you access to that. Uh, on the Mac, the audio subsystem is extremely sophisticated and will give you access to every possible knob that you can, uh, that you can touch on a Mac, right? So that's the approach that we've taken, uh, exposing and surfacing the existing hardware features and the platform features. And you see that happening, for example, with MonoTouch and Mono for Android. Uh, there's no right ones run everywhere uh, approach to user interface design. You really have to build one per platform. So um, what that means in practice, um, what that means in practice is that uh, when you're designing your application, you really should be thinking about how much of the code if you're going to run in multiple platforms you can actually share. So in this diagram, I kind of show you a little bit of, of, uh, of what you do. On Windows, Xbox, and Windows Phone, uh, you would be using Microsoft.NET Framework. Um, or you can use Mono if you insist. Uh, we support it on Windows, um, and Unity has support to Xbox. But in general, you'll be using .NET on those platforms, unless you want to make 
and that mod on your application. Um, and then you need to design code that will run across all platforms. So you would limit the you would limit yourself to the APIs that are across platforms. Again, uh, XML, JSON, Math, uh, um, you know, delegates, asynchronicity APIs, task parallel library, all that stuff. So you get to use all those goodies, but just keep it decoupled from the actual UI. And that will allow you to run your code on all platforms, uh, on Windows, Mac, iOS, Android, Linux, etc. Now, uh, the bad news is that uh, when it comes to building user interfaces, you basically have to rewrite your user interface once per platform. So uh, if you're targeting Windows Phone, you would be using XAML or XNA. If you're targeting the Mac, you would be having a mono Mac facade. If you're using iOS, you would be using mono touch. And Android, you would use mono droid. Uh, you can cheat in a couple of these cases. For example, if your, if your game is entirely XNA based, 100% XNA based, then, um, then you can just use XNA on all four platforms. Or if you're using Unity, uh, if you're using Unity, then you would use the Unity and the Unity UI layer across all platforms. But in general, you should be thinking in terms of splitting your code between this, uh, the top purple bar, which is uh, your shared code, things that would connect to your server, download statistics, achievements, uh, networking, uh, that would connect with other devices, do, uh, you know, uh, synchronize with your servers and so on, um, your engine, your AI, and you would need to split that from user interface. So that's, a, that's an important consideration uh, when you're building mono applications. So now you can use mono in two, in two months of use, and I'll describe those two. Um, one way is, uh, is to just run your application entirely on mono. So you begin with, uh, you know, class blah, static void main, and um, you take it from there. You do everything from mono. Uh, you launch your application and you run the entire thing from there. Um, that is it. So you're running entirely within, uh, within the environment of, of Mono. So your code, which is the red box on the top, or oh, whatever is that color, looks red, reddish, um, runs entirely on top of the Mono runtime and will consume C Sharp and .NET libraries uh, that we expose or that you obtain from a third party. And that could be Mono game, it could, uh, XNA, it could be OpenTK, your physics libraries, networking, and so on. And that's, uh, that's the approach that uh, Infinite Flight has taken, for example. That's the approach that Bastion has taken, for example. Uh, but now I'm going to discuss what uh, Unity has done, for example, or what Second Life has done. Uh, this is a C program. And uh, what you do from a C program is that you actually uh, call into the, mono, uh, into the uh, mono library. So you initialize the JIT engine with the name of your application and the default runtime version that you want to use. Uh, you expose, then you need to expose a couple of, uh, of C functions. In this particular example, let's assume that we have an object, uh, that we have this method, this C method called game object move, which takes a game object parameter. So what I do with this is that I'm actually surfacing the C function uh, to, the, to the .NET world. So once I've done this method, the .NET world can access this method as if it was just a C sharp method. And every time you access it, the mono runtime will basically dispatch your call back into native code into this particular C method. Uh, finally, uh, so you would add here a couple hundred methods I just showed you here. And, uh, and in this particular case, I'm assuming that moving requires some C code and that exploding the object takes some C code as well. Um, the next step is basically to load your assembly. And uh, that, would, that would load the assembly, and you could execute methods uh, written in C-sharp there or in any other managed language from, from C. The second uh, uh, function here called run frame scripts um, basically shows how you would call from the C universe into the C-sharp universe. So, uh, so in, this particular in this particular case, the idea is that uh, the, the, the variable run scripts for frame would actually point to a managed method. So I don't show the code here, but the idea is that you would say, hey, there's going to be a method in scripts.exe called uh, update, for example. And um, so I want to invoke that method, and these are the parameters that I want to use to invoke it. So basically what I'm showing you here is that there's a bidirectional communication between a C application uh, invoking methods in the, in the mono world, um, which in, in the .NET world we call that, uh, we call that uh, managed world, and how the managed world can call back into C, which in the mono world we call unmanaged code. 
So manage is the one that has uh, you know garbage collection and type safety, and unmanage is your C and C++ code. So that is the fundamental idea. You can either run your application entirely contained within Mono, or you can uh, mix and match. And in fact, uh, we mix and match so much that uh, that Mono for Android is actually a blend of three runtimes: uh, the C runtime, the Java runtime, and the Mono runtime all at once. Uh, but uh, the details about that are beyond the scope of this talk. So uh, this gives you an idea a little bit. Uh, basically, your game engine you can substitute that by uh, things like Unity or uh, other engines, and uh, you know your game engine will consume their own game engine libraries. Uh, for example, Unity uses PhysX, um, and uh, Mono is just another library. Just like PhysX is a library, or uh, or FFmpeg is a library, Mono just happens to be another one of your libraries. And the code that you invoke, or the code that is running in the Mono universe, is completely self-contained in a little box in, in your application. So, so that's the other mechanism of using Mono. So these are the basics of using Mono. So now let's move on into you've decided that you want to use Mono either because you love Unity with a, with a passion or you decided that you, you love XNA or you're going to build your own framework uh, all on your own or you have a great idea for a game. So I'm going to give you a couple of uh, a few tips on how, uh, on how to use Mono and things that you need to watch out for as a game developer. Because the things that you need to watch out for as a game developer are not the same that a desktop developer would care about or a web developer would care about. So this is pretty tailored for you guys. Uh, the first thing that you need to understand is that Mono actually has two code generation backends. Uh, a, genera a code generation backend is a piece of code that will actually that will take uh, that will take your C# -sharp code and will make it run natively on your machine. Uh, we have a we have the Mono native backend, which is incredibly fast. It bootstraps our C# -sharp compiler in 0.3 seconds, uh, so it's very very fast at translating C# -sharp code into native code but the output is far from great. Uh, then we also have the LLVM backend, which is very low, slow for code generation. Uh, the same compiler bootstrap takes seven seconds. So that gives you an idea. You pay a high price for using LLVM in terms of startup time, but the quality is unmatched. It's almost as good as C and C++. Now, you might be thinking, uh, why did I say before that you, you, would, you would lose performance? So we'll get to that in a second. Um, but um, the other important thing that you need to know about is that um, is that Mono offers two two mechanisms for running your code. You can either just in time compile or you can compile ahead of time. Uh, just in time compilation happens as you go, um, and this is the mechanism that Mono's SGen uh, code is used by default. And ahead of time compilation lets you pre-compile things, so you could pre-compile things with LVM and then just run that at runtime. And it also happens to be mandatory for a couple of platforms. Now, uh, I told you about arrays bounds checking, about shooting yourself in the foot. Uh, what happens is that to guarantee the, uh, the safety of the environment, a uh, typical array, uh, a typical loop like this um, in C sharp is actually translated into the code below. That means that we need to validate that the uh, value of i is within the range of, uh, of the values in the array so that you don't accidentally overwrite uh, memory. Um, in your process. So that can slow down your code because every time you access an array element, we need to generate that code. So what I'm about to tell you uh, goes against uh, my best judgment and my team's best judgment, but if you absolutely must and you believe that your QA team will approve of this, you can run mono-o unsafe and it will completely eliminate the generation of that code. Now let's talk about uh, garbage collection because it's an important topic. Um, since Mono is a, it's a managed runtime, it will collect the objects for you, so you can, you, can go, you, you can happily allocate and allocate and allocate and never worry about having to deallocate. Mono, at some, time, uh, at some point, the, through some heuristics, will determine that it has allocated too much memory and it should probably get rid of stuff that you're not using. Mono has two garbage collectors, BOEM, our traditional garbage collector, and SGEN, our new generational and super fancy garbage collector. So, um, I'm not going to talk about BOEM, I'm going to talk about our super fancy one, uh, SGEN, because it's the one where most of the lessons will apply. But what is interesting for you to know is that there's an art nursery, uh, there's, a, there's a nursery section and an all generation section. The nursery is a, is a, is a pool of memory of about 4 megabytes by default, and, uh, it's, um, 
and it's where your objects are allocated. All of your threads will start allocating objects there, and there's optimizations for that. Um, and what is nice about the nursery is that it can be collected incredibly fast. Uh, running through the four megabytes of allocation is very, very fast. Um, and uh, the objects that survive a collection in the nursery are actually sent to the old generation. So uh, the, idea, the idea here is that if an object has made it through the, through the first collection, it means that you're probably using it, and it makes no sense to keep scanning it over and over and over again uh, when you run out of memory. So you basically graduate your, uh, your object to the old generation. So uh, the old generation basically has all these H objects, and uh, performing garbage collection over both the nursery and the old generations is a relatively slow process because you have to look at everything in memory. Well, when you look at the nursery, you only have to look at a block of four megabytes. And um, um, so this will come back later, so keep that in mind. And the other thing that you have to remember when it comes to garbage collection is that, um, is that uh, in this graph, for example, I'm showing you that you, uh, a lot of the objects that you're allocated will stay in memory, and you don't really get to choose when, uh, but Mono will eventually go and release the objects, and that can cause a pause. So you can see here that a bunch of objects that had been allocated at the beginning, uh, a couple of seconds later, the garbage collector decided that it needs to release them. Um, but you don't really have control over this and the heuristics are platform specific. So I'm going to give you a couple of hints of how you can deal with this. So in a game, what matters is you don't want to have these pauses that happen accidentally during the execution uh, uh, affect the performance of your game. So some of the best, uh, some of the, uh, of, of the tricks that you can apply are for you to pre-allocate any major objects before you enter the, the heat of the moment. So, uh, so before you enter your battle or something that will require uh, the user to not be paused. So pre-allocate your objects, use buffer, uh, you can use buffer pools, uh, WCS, and even server applications use this technique. Um, and, but the most interesting thing is that you should try to only use a nursery. So um, if you need, if you determine that you need to use objects and there's no way you can eliminate those allocations, try to stay within four megabytes of memory allocations uh, because you will be able to quickly collect those. Um, and also, what is very interesting about the nursery is that you can, you can actually use gc.collect0, and that will instruct the garbage collector to only do a garbage collection over the nursery. So it will only collect objects that have been allocated in the nursery. So this is ideal because you can control which objects, uh, and you can actually get, uh, and you know that the pause time will be minimal compared to a full garbage collection. And finally, try to use structs instead of classes. I'm going a little fast because I, I just noticed that, that I'm running a little bit behind. Um, so the idea with using GC Collect Zero is that you can make it as, it can be one of the steps in your game to basically say, just like I devote some time to computing physics or update the game logic or audio checks, you could, in a couple of frames, you could do a GC Collect Zero. Don't do it on every frame, but you, know, you could do it every, uh, every uh, 60 or 100 frames. And if you use GC Collect Zero, it will be limited to the nursery, so it won't collect everything. So you won't have a big pause. The other thing that you can do is that uh, the other thing that you can do to avoid pauses, but this requires a more sophisticated design, is is to remember that the garbage collector will stop all threads that are under Mono's control, but you could always create a thread that is outside of Mono's control. Uh, and that means that it's a thread that will not have access to the garbage collector or manage heat. It has to be a thread written in C or C++. And the idea is that um, you will let uh, your mono threads do anything that they want, your game thread, your network thread, your IO thread, uh, but the game thread needs to update a lock-free structure or some structure that is shared with the uh, unmanaged thread um, that will render a scene. So, and, and what you do is basically you let the unmanaged uh, piece of code, the C or C++ code, always keep the display moving regardless of what Mono is doing. Mono might be paused, Mono might be, you know, might be, might be going to sleep, or you can be blocking on some I.O. It doesn't matter as long as your rendering thread is always active. And this is a technique used by Apple Score and Image and Microsoft WPF. Um, they will keep running. It doesn't matter what your, what, that your UI is blocking. They'll keep the animations going uh, as long as you don't try to, uh, to do changes to the UI. Well, as long as you don't try to pump events. Sorry about that. Um, so this brings me to the last topic of the day, and it's probably the most exciting one, which is coroutines. And, uh, and this is interesting for many developers. 
Um, when you're writing AI for your game, your first, uh, when you get started, you're probably going to be doing something like this if you're rolling out your own engine. If you're using Unity, it's different because they have a coroutine system in place. But typically, developers would write something like this. They would do, they will, they will, they will write a state machine. And basically, uh, every time that uh, your AI code runs, in this particular case, uh, depending on the current state, you would execute a different, uh, a different uh, piece in the case system. Uh, there's variations of this, of course, but the basic idea is that the transition from one state to the other is done through a variable, and uh, you basically relinquish control um, after something happens. This is an incredibly simple program, uh, but you can see already that it's a little bit annoying to follow, and obviously it only has a couple of states. It's not even that sophisticated or that interesting. So. Um, so the problems with this course, uh, with this system, with state machines and callbacks is that uh, the code is fairly repetitive. It's very hard to debug. Uh, it's cumbersome. It's cumbersome to read. It's cumbersome to debug. It's cumbersome to modify or alter. So if your game designer comes back and says, hey, this is not fun at all, uh, you're in for a, for a lovely day of making changes to your code. Uh, one possible optimization is to change these uh, nice labels, state.chase for constants, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So you can avoid typing code, but then, uh, you know, good luck uh, tracking that, those changes later. It's just very, very ugly. Uh, it's error prone, and, uh, and propagating errors or protocols and uh, propagating states becomes very, very complicated. And again, it's a case of the life is too short. So although there's many options on how you can solve these problems, uh, a, common, a common approach that is, uh, that, is, that is followed by game developers is to use core routines. And I'm not going to go into all the possible solutions uh, on core routines. You should get the slides later and look at the backing slides at the end of this presentation for more information. But I'm going to talk at a particular, <coughs> at a particular technique that is now available with C-Sharp 5, which we find fascinating. Um, and that is async programming. So what it does is that async programming, this new support that, uh, that uh, C-Sharp has uh, introduced, allows, the, allows you to write code that the compiler will rewrite into a state machine for you. You don't need to do anything. The compiler will happily rewrite any method that you throw at it into a state machine. Well, there's a couple of limitations. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but the idea is that the tasks are scheduled on your main thread. And in fact, that's not really true. The task can be scheduled anywhere you want. You can schedule the execution in any way you want. And this support was initially built by Microsoft for designing interactive UIs. Basically, there's a long history of UIs not being responsive enough. In, uh, in the Windows world or the mobile world, and they said, and it all comes down to people get lazy. People don't want to write messes like this. Nobody wants to write a mess like that. Um, so everyone said, well, you get sloppy. Uh, maybe for your main application, you do it right. But then you need to do just this little thing, and you, you get sloppy. You say, I'm not going to do that. It's too much work. So you just ignore it. So how can we make it so that people don't get sloppy? How do we make it so that, uh, so that everything is as, as joyful as it should be? And the answer for Microsoft is basically, let's extend the compiler to support these new programming techniques. Uh, so, um, so what they did is they introduced this keyword called await. And what await does is whenever you have a method that has this prefix called async, uh, whenever you use the await keyword, it instructs the compiler to insert a suspension point. And what this is going to do is that it's going to invoke the set sprite method, right? But it will return immediately uh, to the calling site. And uh, whenever the set sprite method decides to signal that it has set the sprite and it has finished its activity, this method will be rescheduled for execution. So your task scheduler will resume execution, and execution will resume here. So you can think of this as threads. You can think of this as if you were using threads, uh, but with the added benefits that this is incredibly cheap, incredibly cheap. The only memory that you're going to pay for this is, uh, is, is uh, memory used by two structures, the task structure and the task state structure. And you can also see that you kind of write very linear code. You write very linear code in that this is something that you could see yourself writing uh, either as a thread or as a, uh, or as something that you can actually understand. And you can actually start to read, uh, you can actually feel what this uh, code will do. You don't need to guess what the states are. You need to track state machines. You don't need to jump through hoops. Uh, you can see what this is doing. Uh, directly. So, uh, so that's a magical way. It lets you write linear code, and it lets you focus uh, focus on the problem. Um, 
Microsoft has added one interesting convention, which is whenever you any task you're doing takes more than 50 milliseconds, make it async. Now, this doesn't apply really to game developers, but it's a good rule that they've enforced now for any I.O. or any routines that need to take a lot of uh, time. So, a um, couple of things that are very interesting that you, that you probably will find interesting. The new networking stack in Monom, all of the system I.O. networking database access have been made uh, async aware, so you can use them directly with async primitives. Um, it required API changes. Well, not API changes, but API extensions. Um, I just mentioned that anything that takes more than 50 milliseconds should be made async. So whenever you're dealing with very large documents, like XML documents or JSON data, we'll have async uh, APIs for you. And what is interesting is that you can blend, uh, you can blend your task with threads, uh, because the same task that can be uh, just an, uh, a a suspended task from your AI could also be dispatched in multiple cores. It's all the same primitives. So this is a little bit of a more interesting. Uh, it's a little bit of a more interesting sample uh, using async. Uh, but you can see immediately that you can tell what things are doing, and uh, and you immediately know wh what things suspend execution. So you can you can see how trying to rewrite this thing in a state machine would make for some very inconvenient code uh, to build. So um, just uh, every time, uh, every one of those underlined words basically means suspend execution after you launch this method and return to the caller. And whenever uh, this is rescheduled, execution contains at that point. So uh, since we're running uh, down on time, I'm not going to talk about uh, how this works with uh, web development and how you could merge this with the uh, directly with the, with the task that I just showed you, but there's enough information in the backup slides that you can look at. Um, but basically, again, um, the idea is to, to, to avoid messes like this and turn them into something a lot simpler. So these two pieces of code are equivalent, except one is compiler main maintained, another one is human maintained. And with that, uh, we can go to the Q&A section. Uh, like I said, the slides will have more content when they get posted online. Uh, and that's it. Thank you, Miguel. <clears throat> so as Miguel said, we are running a little bit late. Uh, so I'm just going to select a couple of questions, OK? And if there are more space at the end, we can continue uh, asking Miguel more questions. So the first question is um, from Jeff Ward. So um, what is the state of debugging an object that is in async hold? So how hard it is to, to do to do a code that is using async? How hard it is to write async code? It's very, very easy. I just showed to you debug. That, uh, to debug. Oh debug. You treat it in the same way that you would treat uh, that you treat regular code. Um, the reality is that when we emit symbols, uh, when the debugger emits symbols, it basically just tells uh, um, you know the file uh, the de the debug output basically says this is belongs to this line, belongs to this code. But when you're executing, you just treat it as a return. Um, you don't really see it happening. Um, a way, when you have an away that actually resume, uh, you know, queue some work, you just it's seen as a return statement. So if you try to single step array, it just goes back to the caller until you resume execution at that point. So uh, it can be a little bit confusing. He's right, uh, but all you would need to do is just set a breakpoint on the next line um, to debug that stuff. Okay. So you have shown uh, some examples of binding C code to Mono. Is there any way to, is there any support for C++? Is it possible to use Microsoft uh, C++ CLI compiler, or do you have any other solution? Uh, right, so I'm going to say that if you want a solution today, just make sure that all of your C++ methods are wrapped in C methods so that we can call them uh, from C. I know that that is a bit inconvenient, but that is the most robust option you have. There, you can also use a technology called Swing. Uh, Swing will generate those bindings for you, but I, I, my, my experience with Swing is that it generates code that is too verbose. Um, so my suggestion, stick with C public APIs, and if you have to, use Swing. Uh, now to address the other question, C++ CLI, you can't really use it because C++ CLI sadly generates a lot of code that calls into the Win32 API. Um, so that is a problem, and um, they don't generate pure C++, uh, pure CLI code. There's a number of threads on the mono mailing list that deal on how people have hacked around this, but I don't think it's a very robust answer uh, given the current state of the hacks. 
finally, there's a technology that we've been working on called CXXI that will get you close to what you need, but it's not a 100% solution. So um, you need to look at whether that would fulfill your needs. It's, uh, it's trying to cope with a subset of C++ that we consider easy to bind. Um, so I'm sorry that I don't have a much better answer for you on that. On that. Okay, so um, the last question. Um, for many games, especially on mobile platforms, it's important to keep the size of the binaries low. How much overhead does the mono runtime add to the binaries? So usually, um, so the mono runtime, uh, you pay about a two, megabyte, uh, a 2 megabyte price up front, and then you pay by what you use, right? So um, if you just use the base class libraries, um, you know, and you use a good blend, let's say they use I.O., networking, um, some XML, you'll probably pay another megabyte worth of space, uh, maybe two megabytes, depending if you use schemas or not. Um, now, the, 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 way, the reason why we can do this is because Mono on mobile platform actually doesn't work in the same way that the .NET framework or Java does. We don't distribute the whole framework. Uh, we, we use a traditional linker. We wrote a linker that basically uh, strips out anything that you don't use. So, if you use, for example, console.writeline, we'll bring writeline, we'll bring system string, we'll bring UTF-8 encoding. Um, but we're not going to bring anything else. For example, we're not going to bring URIs. But if, for example, if you decide to bring uh, an XML document loader, we'll bring anything that is needed to run the XML loader. Uh, so it's basically a matter of you pay for what you use. Uh, but I would say the baseline is about 2 megabytes, and then you pay by feature that you consume. Uh, so, for example, we had some users that uh, uh, we had some users that used uh, uh, that used a very large XML stack, and uh, you know they were just using a routine that looked very innocent, but it did the entire it loads the entire XML document, runs XML validation, XML schema validation, uh, and uh, all of that is a monster. So it looked very innocent. It looked like just an extra parameter that set, that passed the schema, but uh, you know they had to pay two megabytes for that. So. Um, so you just need to keep an eye uh, on those things. Okay, thank you for your answers. Uh, we have many more questions, but uh, we are running a little bit late, so we are going to start with uh, the next section of the talk now. And I think we should have uh, a lot more time for uh, for more questions and answers uh, by the end of the talk. So uh, I'd like to turn it over to our next presenter, Matthew Laban. It's going to be about uh, this part of the talk. It's going to be about. Uh, um, using Mono and Mono Touch to port a game from Windows Phone 7 to iOS um, using Mono Touch. Uh, so Philippe and I will be talking. I'll be doing most of the talking because Philippe has had some issues uh, connecting uh, reliably today. Um, so let's go. So the incentive for this um, this session is uh, first we're going to talk about like who we are, uh, what uh, the company does, and uh, and we'll be talking about our main product, which is Infinite Flight, uh, a flight simulator for uh, mobile platforms. And then uh, we'll go into um, the, the, the big parts uh, of this session, which is the actual porting from Windows Phone to iOS. Uh, we'll go over the development environment, uh, the 3D graphics um, API that we used, uh, the user interface uh, system that we selected, um, and some of the device-specific APIs uh, that we used. Then we'll go over the next steps for the company and the, the project conclusion and a quick video uh, if my connection can handle it and a QA, sec a QA session. Uh, so who are we? Uh, Flying Development Studio is a pretty new company. We were created in 2010. We're a small team of uh, two developers um, uh, working uh, independently. Um, uh, both of us are you know, passionate about 3D graphics and uh, flight simulation in general. Um, and we're the developers of uh, the, the, the game Infinite Flight. Um, so Infinite Flight is uh, a flight simulator for a mobile platform. And it's the target audience for this simulator is, uh, is not only pilots, it's uh, anyone that's interested in aviation uh, in general. And pilots can definitely um, recognize some of the good feeling of, uh, of airplane flying. Uh, from what we heard, and we also had uh, toddlers play with the game, and they also enjoy it. So, it's pretty much for everyone. Uh, the target platforms for the for this um, for this flight simulator for now is mainly mobile platforms. Uh, so we're out, like I said, on, on Windows Phone 7. We've been out for uh, a, you know almost almost a year now. 
Um, uh, with support, in terms of features, we have uh, 13 airplanes coming in the next version, uh, ranging from commercial jets like the 747, um, the Airbus uh, 380, 321, we have uh, the new 787. In terms of single engine pistons, we have a Cessna 172, a Cirrus SR22, uh, and we have uh, funky planes like the uh, FA-18, and the Supermarine Spitfire, and uh, heavy like this um, C-17, like a heavy military transport airplane. Um, we have uh, two main regions supported at this time. Uh, there's uh, Northern California, which comprises uh, the area around San Francisco, um, uh, and all the airports in the metropolitan area. And the second area is actually much bigger than the first one, and it's uh, SoCal, uh, ranging from uh, Tijuana, San Diego to Mojave Desert, uh, and extending from Palm Springs to uh, LA um, on the west east uh, uh, sections. Uh, so it's a fairly big area. We have 130 plus airports uh, modeled, so it's, it's a good area to explore and have fun in. Uh, we also have support for missions. Uh, so far we only have one mission, but we're uh, planning on uh, having more in the next versions. So the one we have now is a, a space shuttle mission um, where people can uh, practice their landing uh, um, skills uh, in the space shuttle at different uh, difficulty levels. So the idea is that you land the space shuttle uh, on a path that's as most precise as possible and um, on, on the right track and right speed and the closer you are to the defined parameters, the, the higher your score is. Um, and that all goes to our uh, online leaderboards where people can compare their score and they can compare also their um, flight time and landing counts. Uh, we've got people who have like 300 hours of, of flying time, so it's people are getting uh, pretty heavy with the flying. Um, we also have uh, time and weather settings. You can uh, set um, your uh, your time of day. We have four presets uh, at this time, and in terms of weather, weather settings, we have um, possibility to change um, the wind uh, speed, direction, and gusts, and the visibility. Um, so people ask often about the flight model. So it's a proprietary system that we've designed in-house, and um, I mean we've had it tried uh, by some pilots, and you know the feeling is is pretty good. There's of course some shortcomings in terms of like spins and and weird uh, flight behaviors, uh, but overall it's a pretty good flight model we think. Um, so the timeline for the the game. Uh, so the first release 1.0 was in April 2011. Uh, it's, this took us about seven months of development. Um, it's important to note that we're actually uh, working on this part-time, um, so it's not a full-time thing. Uh, the, the original version had uh, one airplane and one scenery, and that came out only for Windows Phone 7. Um, so in September 2011, uh, we started um, the iOS ports, but the, the first part was actually going to uh, Xbox 360, so that was the first idea that we had. Um, to simplify the transition to iOS later. And uh, just about when the uh, Xbox 360 version was, was almost ready, um, we thought of uh, trying to see if, you know, how much effort it would take to go to iOS. And it turned out it wasn't so hard. I mean, it was still hard, but uh, there was a lot of things that were already supported. We could, you know, show the UI, and uh, we just needed to make a few changes to, uh, to make things work. And then, uh, so we moved on, we kept developing on WP7 at the same time. Uh, the last version out for Windows Phone is um, uh, version 2.1, um, and that has Mango support, so that's the new features for the Windows Phone uh, 7.5, which brings uh, multitask multitasking for uh, Windows Phone, um, instead of the uh, tombstoning system that they had uh, previously. Uh, we, we have uh, 12 airplanes and two scenery packages, so there's only one extra airplane that, that we've had it since then. Um, and today, uh, February 2012, uh, we are about to release the uh, iOS version as a universal app for the iPod Touch, uh, iPhone 4 and 4S, iPad 1 and iPod 2, uh, iPad 2. Um, so that's, uh, that's coming uh, in the next few weeks. We're just about to send the last beta to our uh, beta testers. Um, so it's, it's almost ready. Uh, all right, so let's look at some screenshots so you guys can uh, get a feel of what it looks like. Um, so this, the first one is uh, the Cessna 172 over San Francisco airport. 
Um, and uh, so you can see the, uh, the taxiway, taxiway layouts. We can see the, the runways and um, and uh, the coastline areas. So it's it's pretty detailed. Keep in mind it's for a mobile phone, so we could have more in details later. But so, so far we're we're bound by the, the performance of the phones. And the second one is the U.S. Airways uh, uh, Airbus uh, 321. A pretty detailed airplane. Um, here we have. Uh, screenshot of the, the heads-up display um, then, uh, that shows uh, the airspeed, altitude, uh, instrument landing system. We've got uh, runway lighting and uh, you can get a feel of the uh, visibility and, uh, and um, um, sorry, sunrise uh, in, this, in this screenshot. The second one is uh, C-17 landing at San Francisco, pretty detailed airplane. Um, uh, here you can see the F-18 uh, that's over San Francisco again, and you can get a feel of uh, the visibility range that we've uh, been able to achieve. So this is about 25 kilometers or 35 kilometers. The maximum we have is 45 kilometers, which is pretty good for, you know, for a flight simulator, especially for mobile phones. Um, and this other one uh, is a, the other screenshot is a Supermarine Spitfire. That's an airplane for the World War II. Uh, that was a request from our uh, UK base, which is pretty big. It's actually our second base, second biggest uh, user base of the game yeah, behind the US. Um, here we have a 747, you know, taken off from Palm Springs, and you can see the, the, the terrain data and terrain uh, landscape. And the other one is a uh, Cirrus SR-22 flying over Catalina Island. Um, the coast of Los Angeles, and you can see again some of the details of the coastlines in that picture. All right, so now let's get to um, the interesting part, which is the port from Windows Phone to iOS. Uh, so the main goals that we had in this port um, uh, were three, like main, three main main points. Uh, we wanted feature parity. We didn't want to have any uh, special features for any of the platforms. Um, so everything that was working on Windows Phone should work on iOS and vice versa. If we had something, it has to work on the other one. Um, we wanted to have comparable performance and rendering quality. So if we could avoid having uh, to use workarounds for for things in, ter in terms of rendering and performance, you know, it would have been better. Um, and uh, wanted to maximize the code sharing so that uh, maintenance would be uh, would be the easiest. Uh, Will be uh, will be easy. Um, in terms of the challenges that we faced, uh, obviously bringing uh, four more, four or five more devices uh, is bringing a lot of hardware fragmentation. We already had just a slight taste of it with Windows Phone when, when uh, the Mingo phones came out, because the uh, the original versions of Windows Phone were pretty slow in terms of CPU and GPU performance. Um, and uh, the new version, which um, have faster CPUs, faster GPUs, are actually better. So we have to take now a lot of attention, we have to pay a lot of attention um, in the features we're adding to make sure that it's working on, on this whole range of, um, of devices. Uh, we've also um, uh, encountered some, some minor implementation differences in the .NET framework uh, between the platforms. Uh, that was, that was uh, something we uh, also had on, on Xbox 360 where some of the XML serialization was not implemented. Um, also we had to make some some uh, some changes in our um, in our uh, configuration system and the way we save uh, the user data. Uh, and the last one is uh, quite a big challenge is that we're a small team of two guys and uh, we are working part-time on the project. So that's uh, that's quite a challenge. So uh, let's look at uh, the development environment uh, and how we work on this project. So on Windows, we're using Visual Studio. Uh, that's coupled with the uh, Windows Phone SDK. Uh, that complement uh, with, the, um, uh, with the XNA SDK, of course. And on um, Mac, we're using MonoDevelop and MonoTouch. Uh, and there's, there's a, it's, they're pretty easy to install, and they're, they're pretty good uh, toolkits and, and SDKs. So, it was a it was a, a pretty easy transition uh, from Visual Studio and Windows. Um, so uh, the the build system is is pretty simple. We have one solution per platform and and a set of uh, projects uh, for each of the platforms, and they all pretty much point to the same uh, to the same game files, uh, so that they're all C sharp code. Um, so we it's it's pretty easy for us to uh, to maintain the code in the, in the state. Um, it's important to note that. Uh, 
uh, most, if not all, of the game code, which is purely the game code, like simulation of the the airplanes, um, the, the, um, uh, like rendering of the terrain, all of that is is actually shared. There's no specific code for that uh, for any of the platforms. So for the content pipeline. Uh, we're using the same system for both platforms. It's, uh, in this case, we're actually not building the, the, the content for Mac on the Mac, but we're building it with um, a special solution that we have that builds the content uh, for each of the platforms that, that runs on Windows. So we're using the actual XNA content pipeline generator thing to uh, create all the binary um, formats and files uh, that we can uh, then uh, transfer over to the Mac uh, solution, uh, and that's that's taken as resources built into the binaries and loaded at runtime. Uh, so the advantage of that is that we're um, we're using the uh, the content importers, importers and processors that come with an XNX content pipeline, which is pretty solid. Um, and a, a big chunk of uh, the development part is the uh, the use of mono game. Uh, so because when we went to iOS, we did a way to render. Um, the, the three graphics, and on Windows Phone we're using XNA, um, and uh, so we, we we looked for an alternative for iOS, and uh, the one that seemed the most complete and, uh, and easy to work with was uh, MonoGame. So we did, we worked a lot of MonoGame, and and we'll talk about this in this slide. Um, so this is the open source implementation of XNA on on many platforms. Uh, when we started working with it. Um, so the, the, we had some problems, and we, there was a lot of missing functionalities and issues that we had to uh, to overcome. The biggest one was the incomplete support for 3D. Um, so there was only the only thing we could show uh, when we just grabbed um, or just uh, created our branch was just uh, the menus, and some of that some of it was not working so well, depending on some some situations. Uh, so we had to um, implement the 3D. Uh, first, we did that in, um, in OpenGL 1.1, and after struggling with performance and, and uh, issues with rendering, we moved on to OpenGL 2.0, OpenGL ES 2.0. Uh, also, we had to uh, code the importers. Uh, one big chunk is that there was no 3D model importer, uh, so there was uh, this was aided by Microsoft, who um, they released uh, the source code to a um, their their binary format uh, processor, um, so we use that as a as a as a model to load the uh, the 3D objects in the uh, in the simulator. Uh, we also added uh, um, support for BVR textures, which are compressed textures that work on on iOS. Um, we also had issues with the uh, iPad Retina display um, because some of the resolutions were not supported. We had some issues also with the orientation support. Uh, especially related to the touch panel. Um, the notification system also was not fully implemented, and uh, we had to rewrite the sound system to use OpenAL instead of the, um, uh, the standard uh, iOS SDK sound system. Um, so that was, it's important to note also that these, some of these problems have been solved. Uh, since we've, we've completely branched our, uh, our, our code uh, from, from the actual develop branch of Mono, Mono Game, um, some of these things have been fixed already. Um, and of course, one important question is, are we giving back the code? Yes, we are. Um, so the changes have been packaged and submitted to the motor game team. Uh, so these guys are um, actually going through the code, and um, they're going to add at their pace of what we've changed. Um, so that's it's pretty good that we've uh, we spent so much time on this, and we were you know we were happy to be kind of isolated from anyone else, you know, bringing changes to our code and breaking everything. Uh, and we think we've got, you know, the rendering is, is similar to uh, what you have on uh, on Windows Phone, so we're pretty happy with the result. Everyone's going to, you know, going to take advantage of it, so that's pretty good. All right, so uh, we'll uh, make the 3D graphics work on um, Mono Game. Um, so it's, it's if one piece of information is that the Mono Touch uses OpenTK uh, to render OpenGL. So OpenTK is an open source library. Uh, that uh, exposes OpenGL to uh, C Sharp. Uh, and the original version of Monotouch did not have the latest OpenTK uh, uh, binaries, so we had to uh, manually add some, um, some missing bindings um, uh, to support some of the features. I forgot for what, but there was, uh, there was some missing features that we had to support. Um, 
But that was uh, fixed by Monotouch 5.2, which was just released uh, last week, I think. And they've updated the, the um, reference of OpenTK to the latest uh, version. Um, as I mentioned in the previous slides, we had to, um, to uh, uh, create the model loader. Uh, so that's from the, uh, from the example of Microsoft. And uh, it's, it's working it's pretty fast, and it's, it's included, included inside the, uh, the changes for MonoGain. Um, <clears throat> one, one thing we had to um, pay close attention to was the, the performance. Um, when, we, uh, when we moved to, to uh, OpenGLES 2, um, we had to take care of, uh, we had to pay attention to the state changes. So we uh, built a caching system uh, to make sure we don't uh, um, set redundant states and um, lose performance on that. Um, and we actually apply all the changes on, on the draw methods of the graphic device. So that's actually uh, what, what you know, made us uh, get some significant performance uh, improvements. Um, <coughs> So also one important uh, difference from uh, from uh, XNA and OpenGL is that the sampler states are per texture object and not uh, on the device level itself. So we had to keep track of uh, um, the the sampler state per texture to make sure also we don't uh, set them two times or multiple times if not needed. Um, uh, about the um, effects in GLSL, um, it's important to note that there is no effect container in OpenGL yet, so no .fx file format, so you can't really parse that and have that supported. So we implemented our own um, effects in GLSL based on the stock effect code sample that's uh, provided by Microsoft. So it's it's um, it's a set of the effects that are used uh, by um, XNA, uh, because XNA does not expose shaders directly. Um, they have, at least for Windows Phone, they have a set of uh, uh, shaders or more like effects that you can uh, tweak some knobs on. Um, but you can't really have your own shader code running on, on Windows Phone at this time. So we had to kind of emulate that and make expose the same behavior to iOS. Uh, so uh, about the user interface, so that was an important part uh, that we had to, uh, to work on. And that's a decision we made a long time ago when we uh, originally started uh, the, uh, the game. We did not have many plans to go multi-platform at the time, although we thought this would be, uh, this would be an option later on. Um, but the way we decided on, on our system for UI was, was um, after looking at the, the state of, uh, of the UI toolkits at the time. Uh, so that was in September 2010, around this time. Um, so some of the toolkits, I mean, Windows was not released yet. So uh, some of the toolkits that we uh, found were paid uh, or out of date, or uh, most of them did not have any support for Windows Phone 7. Um, of course, there are more options available today. I just looked today. There's a lot of uh, toolkits that are actually being maintained uh, actively. Um, so that's maybe you don't have to follow our the way we did it. Um, so some people might remember that uh, since Mango, Microsoft brought uh, Stimulite and XNA integration. Um, so that's something that uh, allows developers um, running XNA games to blend Stimulite uh, rendering on top of it. Uh, so we could have used that, but there was two reasons why we didn't. First, it was too late because we already had made a decision to use something else. Um, and second, it's not really cross-platform because we can't use that on Xbox 360. We can't use that on iOS. So it's not really something we, we, we could have used. So we set up for a custom implementation. Um, so out of desire to control the code and, and, and potential port to other platform to make it easy to, to port it to other platforms. Uh, so uh, the way we uh, create the UI is uh, using expression blend, and we output uh, we, we get the output uh, XAML. So XAML is a uh, is a maximal um, definition of UI that Microsoft is using for uh, Civilite and WPF. And um, so we we're using uh, this tool that's that's pretty powerful to create uh, to create the UI. So you can see a screenshot underneath um, where we have the main main menu. Uh, with grids and buttons, and and we we export the we get the output that's on this page as an example. Uh, it's basically just XML, which is super easy to parse in in, uh, in C sharp. Um, so for this, we just we just parse the data and make the make the renderer like we implemented the renderer to render all the stuff in uh, in XNA. Uh, so 
uh, we use this a, a, a page navigation system inspired from Simulite. Uh, so they have this uh, navigate to page, uh, go back, and uh, we thought this was pretty powerful, so we inspired our, our system from that. Um, so the original layout um, was based on Canvas because uh, Canvas and, and WPF Simulite is is something that takes uh, control that, that that has inner controls that are um, uh, telling their position by absolute references. Uh, so, um, so you, if the resolution is fixed, it's not really an issue. But once we started porting to uh, iOS, then the resolution was different, so we couldn't really use absolute coordinates anymore. Um, so we tried different types and methods of scaling, and nothing really worked. Um, so we eventually settled on on uh, using grids with um, with um, proportional values set for all the all the columns and rows. So that they resize properly, uh, based on the on the screen resolution and uh, and aspect ratio. So the, the support we have uh, so far is uh, is basically buttons, checkboxes, list views, list box, uh, uh, sliders, and we have uh, basic support for data binding um, at this time. So here's uh, here's some screenshots of the interface. It's not prettiest interface we need to, we need to get a, a, a designer in there but um, so you have uh, you have the sliders with um, a data there are data bounds to a background data model so whenever you update the slider position uh, the underlying data model is updated automatically and vice versa um, so that's that's the way it's work it's working is it's, it's similar to what you have in symbolite and WPF so you can bind your data inside expression blend uh, to make sure it works fine, and then you can import the XAML inside our, our code, um, inside, our, inside our application, and it should work the same. Uh, the one on the right is um, is a picture of uh, the logbook, uh, which uh, logs and shows you all the flights you've done. And uh, this is also using data binding, uh, so we bind the item source of that uh, that control. Um, um, and the control, and then uh, and then the columns are all um, are all um, automatically populated based on um, on on the uh, what's it called yeah on the data that's inside each of the items. Uh, and so here's one important aspect that we've uh, we faced. So uh, when you look at the layout for multiple uh, platforms, uh, it's easy to do if you have devices that have the same um, same size. So, for example, if you're going from a Windows phone to an iPhone, then you can pretty much keep the same uh, layout. But in our case, um, we couldn't for the iPad because we tried uh, just reskinning the UI with the standard system. Uh, but you can you quickly find that uh, it's very difficult to handle. For example, these the buttons in the middle, the reset flight buttons, uh, they're pretty inaccessible with your thumb without letting go of the size of the um, the iPad. So we had to use to, to, to hack a little bit and have some special layouts for um, the iPad uh, so that everything's accessible uh, from the thumbs uh, without having to let go of the side of the, the iPad. And it's important because if you if you move your hand too far away, then the iPad moves and then since the accelerometer is controlling the attitude of the plane, and you, it might lead to crashes and you know, errors. So and crashes of the plane, not the game. Um, all right, so let's see another uh, example of the user interface and the changes we've had to do with uh, the iPad versus the iPhone slash Windows Phone 7. Uh, this is the, um, the typical user interface we have uh, when you're playing the game. Um, and the one on the left is the, uh, if you're running on, on, a, on a phone, like a small device, small, small size device. So all the buttons are, are laid out pretty much everywhere on the screen and mostly on the, on the left and right. And um, if you look at the iPad version, you'll notice that the buttons are not extending all the way up because there's no way you can reach a menu button that's all the way, all the way at the top without letting go of the control or without moving your hand on the, on the iPad. And that's also important if you're playing lying in a bed because if you let go of one side of the, of the iPad, it falls on you. So it's pretty unusable. Uh, so we had to do these things to make sure that, that the game is usable. So that's, that's you know, a big, a big chunk of work has been spent uh, uh, trying to adapt that to multiple uh, multiple aspect ratios and device types, and we're actually glad to have uh, our own system for this because there's some of the things that we had to 
we, we might have had some trouble looking at some of the, the samples that are used today, uh, the, sorry, the uh, SDKs that are available today for UI. Some of this stuff might have been difficult to do. All right, so now let's look at the other things that we had to, um, to implement or use. Um, so obviously, uh, the motion API is something that's, that's important for a flight simulator because that's the way you control um, the airplane. Uh, so on this part, there was no major differences. Of course, we had to wrap everything inside, our, uh, inside a class that exposes some, some basic properties. Um, but there was nothing different, there no major differences that, that caused us uh, a lot of pain. So that was, that was pretty easy to transition. Uh, the touch panel is the same. I mean, most of the events were easily translated into something that uh, motor game could, uh, could grab. Um, display was something that was problematic, like I mentioned, mainly for the UI uh, because, uh, uh, because we had to resize controls and make sure that uh, the, the, um, the, um, the, file, the field of view kept, uh, was the same or was similar uh, depending on the, uh, the screen resolution. Um, so that was something we struggled a bit on. Um, Stan mentioned before, we had to rewrite the model game implementation to use OpenAL. So that, all, that means that we brought 3D sound to uh, model game as well because we we couldn't uh, we couldn't do that with the standard uh, uh, iOS SDK sound system. Uh, notification was something also we uh, we had to uh, to work around because on Windows Phone uh, most of the notifications are synchronous. So if you if you pop up a message box, um, that message box will will hold. Uh, the execution of the code um, until the user dismisses the message box. On iOS, it's different. Um, it's asynchronous, so you have to implement uh, some kind of callback system when the user clicks on, on a particular button in the message box. And the last point, sir, the file system networking. Uh, pretty standard .NET Mono stuff here, so I mean, this is the power of .NET. No, no, nothing special to do. Everything was working just fine out of the box, and we didn't have to do any special code. So now onto the performance consideration. So that's that's a really important part um, of the port. We spent a lot of time uh, optimizing things um, during this port. Um, so what we noticed, like after after optimizing, that most of the the pain points we had on iOS were the same ones that we faced on Windows Phone before released in uh, uh, April 2011. Um, main main issue is the garbage collection. Um, so, like uh, like you heard in the, in the previous talk by Miguel, um, obviously you need to reduce implicit memory allocation, like the operators link for each, uh, because these things actually create objects on your behalf and they trash the memory and they create a lot of garbage. Um, so you have to pay attention to that and try to reduce the, how much you're using of those. And of course, you have to reuse memory, create pools, um, whenever possible. And that's also, of course, uh, this is valid mostly for the, for the rendering loop. Everything that happens in the update and render, you have to pay attention to that. If it's just rendering the UI, it's not a big deal because most of the UI is 60 frames per second, so it doesn't really matter. When you're rendering something, for example, uh, or just updating something, for example, in the, uh, uh, the part that handles the, uh, the flight model, we, we iterate over multiple times for, for the wings, uh, many points over the wings to compute uh, the angle of attack and forces um, uh, to make the plane fly. And this is something that you really don't want to have memory leaks or memory you know, garbage uh, created here because it's, it's running you know, 100 times per, per frame. Uh, so you want to make sure that, that uh, this is really clean. Um, in terms of the hardware limitations, uh, like I mentioned, uh, we already had a, a little bit uh, a taste of it uh, with uh, when Windows Phone Mango came out, because the new phones were more powerful than the old ones. So we had to uh, to pay attention to uh, the new features we were adding, not to uh, not to uh, penalize uh, the uh, the users that had pre that generation one phones. So. This is something we spent a lot of time on. Um, and we actually used, for the iOS version, we actually used uh, a pretty powerful tool. It's, uh, it's um, uh, the, uh, I think it's called Instruments. Yeah, Instruments. That, um, uh, that comes with the iOS SDK. And that shows you a pretty good uh, detail of uh, whatever's taking time in your code uh, with the call stack and everything. And also, we were worried when we started working with that, that since the code is with 
compiled with Mono, and then it's it's compiled to native code. So we didn't know how the all the call stack and all the symbols would look like, but it looks pretty good, and you can definitely find out who's taking time and what's who's the CPU hog in your in your code. Um, so we spent a lot of time on that, and actually that actually brought a lot of uh, uh, optimizations over to Windows Phone. So the the original um, code that we had for Windows Phone is actually faster now. Uh, for example, we had um, we had enabled when when Mango came out, we had enabled uh, multi sampling on uh, on uh, on rendering, and most of the guys working uh, for that still had uh, generation one phones couldn't use this feature because it was way too slow. And now with all the optimization, you can actually play with a generation one phone with uh, MSAA. So that's a pretty good uh, that's a pretty good uh, achievements, and we were pretty happy about that. Um, the next one is the memory. So the memory was something that we struggled a, a lot on, uh, because especially because the iPod um, fourth generation and the iPad one only have 256 megs of RAM. So that's not a lot, and obviously we're we're consuming a lot of memory because we're creating a lot of textures for the terrain. So we spent a lot of time finding ways to optimize, and something we uh, that we that helped us a lot was. Uh, Using uh, PBR textures like comp texture compression, because we were using uh, the first time we were started uh, we started coding was using the uh, uh, DXT5, um, so the the standard uh, DirectX compression that we were impressed and compressing on the fly to RGBA, uh, which was not which was slow and also taking a lot of memory. So we tried as much as possible to convert all our textures um, in the content pipeline of iOS to uh, PBRs. And that saved us a lot of memory. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't really uh, make it work for the uh, iPod 4 and iPad 1, so we had to lower the terrain resolution uh, so for the textures and for the actual elevation uh, data, set, data sets. Um, so that's done on the fly. We still have the same uh, the same uh, data in the back, but uh, we actually reduced the textures and and um, and data size for the for the elevation. So for the optimizers on, on the OpenGL ES front, um, so it's important to note that now, as, as of right now, we're actually not GPU bound. So all the stuff, all this, the time we spend, we spend is uh, is on the uh, the CPU. Uh, so uh, so we spent a lot of time optimizing the the state changes. So it was uh, same same with your OpenGL analyzer tool that comes with uh, iOS SDK was was pretty helpful with that. It told us. Uh, uh, the number of state changes that were redundant, um, so we tried to limit those as much as possible. Uh, and one thing we also optimized was the use of uh, the shaders. So the initial idea was to use a Uber shader that's, uh, that uh, has multiple branches and and based on the uh, the parameters, if you want fog, if you want uh, textures, if you want vertex color, it was uh, it was branching the code uh, with if else's. So that turned out to be pretty slow. Uh, so we used uh, many small shaders instead. Uh, so basically, one shader per configuration. So if you have a texture coordinate, if you have texture and a vertex color, then we use this one. If you have texture one light and vertex, so it's a lot of small shaders, but the code is very simple. So it's it's working pretty well so far. Um, Sorry. Right, so now for the next steps. Um, obviously, we want to try to bring more content because the the port to iOS took a lot of our time. So we didn't have time to add new airplanes and new sceneries, so that's something we want to focus on uh, a little bit more next. Uh, and about the platform work, we want to port it to Android. So obviously, all the work we did uh, with OpenGL um, uh, is going to be useful uh, for Android as well because uh, it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, we might also try to release the Xbox 360 version. Uh, about the PC, we often get this question: like, are you guys releasing to PC? Uh, it actually already works on PC. Most of the feature development is done on PC because it's much faster to run um, a PC version than deploying on a device and testing on a device. Um, so we, there's a working version, but we, we don't feel comfortable releasing it yet because it's it's going to be compared to the other PC flight simulators, which are not you know working on on uh, uh, on mobile phones. So we we try to avoid that. Uh, and basically, the next steps are going to be like anywhere .NET and Moto is available. So we hear that the PS Vita is uh, is going to uh, be. I mean, using uh, C Sharp, so maybe maybe if Moto game uh, goes to the PS Vita, will will be there. Uh, so the video, uh, I'm not sure I can play this video because my connection is pretty slow. Um, so you guys can can grab this 
I mean, I can try, and then we'll see uh, see if it works. Uh, oh, never mind. Yeah, I don't have it anymore. It was not working before. Um, let's go back to my show. Um, so you guys can, can watch the videos for it's uh, it's um, the video of uh, the iPad version. Uh, it's it's not the final version that we have right now, but it's it's a it's a more a little more rougher version that we have, um, and it shows uh, some of the some of the features of the game. Uh, if you guys can type that, you can take a look at it and, and see uh, see how it runs. So this is on an iPad 2, and it has. Uh, it's running about 60 frames per second on an iPad 2. The version that, that we show on the video is not as smooth as what we have now. Um, and you can expect on the other devices, on the iPhone 4S, you can expect about 60 frames per second, uh, between 30 to 60 frames per second depending on the configuration. And um, if you uh, the, the slowest uh, device will be uh, the iPod 4. Uh, and I'll put touch for uh, fourth generation because this guy has a small CPU and GPU, so it's going to be about 10 to 30 frames per second, depending on the configuration. Um, so, conclusion: um, we're definitely extremely satisfied with Monotouch and Zamari. I mean, these guys are uh, pretty awesome. I mean, we've we've had uh, we've had some issues with uh, uh, updates, and these guys were responsive. And you know, it's we don't regret any second choosing this for uh, for. Uh, I mean, we don't really have a choice, but I mean, this is just great, and Miguel has been been fantastic. Um, so uh, we're really happy that uh, what we did with Mono Game is actually going to benefit everyone uh, because it's uh, it's something you know that that was that kept us from going to iOS. And now that you know they're going to port everything we did back into the their main develop uh, uh, branch, it's going to be pretty awesome for everyone. Um, so we're happy that the goals of the code reuse and performance were kind of reached because we have uh, we have you know like I mentioned before like good good frame rate on most of the platforms and we can we can definitely uh, whenever we have a feature that we're going to code for Windows Phone it's going to be available for all the platforms um, so that's we're pretty happy about that and the iOS release is, is imminent so it's uh, it's going to come out. Uh, we're going to ship the last beta in about a week, um, and uh, so once we have a definite uh, feedback from our beta testers, uh, we have about 30 people testing uh, right now on Test Flight app. Um, so it's uh, once we have that, then we'll be ready to uh, submit to uh, uh, to the app store, and uh, hopefully everything will go well. Um, so here's some of the resources that you guys can uh, can go check out: uh, Mono Touch, uh, Mono Game, OpenTK. You can find us at flyingdevstudio.com. There's a Twitter feed where we, where we post updates and a Facebook page. Just look for Infinite Flight on Facebook, and you can find you can find all the information, screenshots for the upcoming versions, and they'll pretty much announce everything on on the Facebook and and, and Twitter pages. All right. So, if you want thank you, Matthew. <clears throat> no so, uh, I would first like to let the audience know that. Uh, the recordings and the slides of all the materials related to the talk will be uh, available after the conference, possibly sometime next week. And before we go into the questions, I would like to uh, let you know that uh, Dominique Luis, who is one of the Mono Games maintainers, just uh, mentioned that your changes are in, the, in one of the public development branches uh, of Mono Game. And so they are already publicly available for anyone that is interested. Oh, pretty cool. That's so um, I was I was thinking um, I could try to run the video from my uh, from my system if you want. So I'll. I would uh, sure. Yeah. I'd like to make it run while uh, we go into the QA session. Do you want me to get get the control back to you? Uh, I think I can do that. Okay, cool. Okay. So, let's see if this works. So, are you guys able to see it? Um, oh, that would go too slow. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little slow. We could also share the, um, the YouTube link. 
Yeah, yeah well, so let's, like, let's go back to the uh, to your presentation, and you can just leave that window open so that people can copy the the link. Okay. Or you can just like search for Infinite Flight by iOS Preview in YouTube. But you know, I can I can put the link back if you want. Okay. So. Um, So the first question is, can you talk a little bit more about how you translate uh, HLSL effects to GLSL programs? Um, so that's uh, actually not to do that. So Philippe uh, is having a, maybe he can talk about this, I don't know. Philippe? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear Yeah, you. it's fine. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so we, we, uh, thank you everyone for, for, for listening to our talk first of all. And uh, so uh, to answer the question, um, so what we did is basically took, uh, took the, the Microsoft stock effect sample that they released and uh, we translated that uh, directly from the HLSL. So there's the HLSL that is available to, uh, to GLSL and, um, and uh, at first, I mean, their, their implementation is, is uh, well, it's, it's FX file. So it's a little bit different, and, and we had to split everything in small shaders, like, like Mathieu uh, talked about earlier. Um, but um, that's pretty much it. I mean, it was a straight port. And uh, something to note, though, is that the Mono game, uh, I think they have a new branch now that uh, they, they use um, an actual D3D, com uh, D3D uh, converter. I mean, it converts the, the binary code from the shaders to, uh, uh, to GLSL. Cool. Uh, on the fly, so um, I haven't tested that myself yet, but uh, it's really promising. Uh, I mean, it's really good for for future development when uh, uh, when Microsoft decide to to open up uh, uh, effects, uh, make uh, make uh, custom effects uh, available on Windows Phone. It will be uh, it will be a, a better solution. Uh, for for everybody that want to port uh, their their game from uh, XNA to Moto game, I mean XNA to iOS. Okay, so um, did you notice any significant performance difference between .NET on WP7 and Mono on iOS? Uh, it's it's difficult to tell because we we can't really uh, I and mean, it's. We can't really profile it. I mean, the, the CPUs are not the same, and so it's it's difficult to tell if you know if it's uh, if it's better or not. But we think it might be a little bit slower. But honestly, it's it's hard to tell. So uh, yeah, we, on both platform, we we we're reaching the same uh, almost the same uh, frame per second. So I mean, the the uh, as we we said, uh, the the mono implementation is really really good, um, and and I mean we haven't had any major issue um, on on that that front. Okay, so you said the GPU was not the bottleneck, and so what is your main CPU bottleneck? Um, I think right now it could be uh, it's it's hard to tell because we have a lot of uh, small things taking a lot of time. Um, so it's it's not really. We used to have big big chunks that took a lot of time, but we we just scraped them all. So now it's it's uh, there are parts of the uh, the um, uh, the uh, physics code that's taking a lot of time. Um, so it's it's. Uh, I think we we're down to that now. I think the math dot uh, sqrt is actually taking a lot of time. So uh, we optimize quite a lot. So it's it's uh, it's a bunch of small things now. Okay. There's also there's also the ter the terrain that um, since we we um, we actually create the terrain on the fly since we have s there's so much data that we have to process and and we are on the mobile platform, um, uh, so that that takes some some time to generate all the textures and uh, on the fly. So that this is this is something that we can I mean we, we we're thinking about improving. Uh, I think I think it's. There's a lot of it that's probably uh, on our end that you know try, trying to find better algorithms and, and, and better better way of doing things, um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much where we stand at this point. Mm -hmm. So if I understand it correctly, code needs to be uh, pre-compiled when targeting iOS. Are there any uh, language language features that are missing when you do that? Uh, did you run into any problems due to that? Mm, that's also really. a, probably a question for for Miguel as well. Yeah, 
I mean, on our end, no, we, we didn't have any issues. I mean, most of it is working fine, and we even use their they, uh, they have um, uh, a bunch of optimization options that we uh, we can enable. We even enable those, and it's just fine. We've never encountered any issues. Okay. Yeah, the the actual the act, there are some actual limitations. Um, uh, anything that tries to generate code dynamically, and sometimes .NET developers do like to generate code on the flight just because they can, that's not supported uh, because iOS uh, forbids you from doing that. And that sometimes impacts uh, some uses of generics because generics are not fully, uh, you cannot fully deter determine the full set of uh, uses. So some dynamic uses of generics uh, don't work on iOS. So another question for you, Miguel, now that we have been talking about uh, uh, CPU uh, bottlenecks, are there any profiling tools available for, uh, for Mono? Well, so there are profiling tools. They're a little bit on the, I mean, for a Unix guy, they're perfect because they're command line tools and, uh, and you can profile pretty much any aspect of your Mono application, but the UI leaves a lot to be desired, to be honest. Um, <laughs> so we started rolling out UIs, uh, UIs for a couple of pieces. Uh, so at least right now we have a UI for, the, uh, for memory locations on iOS. Uh, so we're going to be extending that to other platforms, to iOS, Linux, and Mac. Um, but we need to extend that to also performance profiling. That's just the UI. If you feel comfortable using the command line, uh, all the information is there already. It's just it's fairly cumbersome today. Uh, now the good news is that if you're an iOS developer, uh, you get incredibly good data out of instruments. So you can just use the regular instruments to do uh, general performance analysis. Uh, so as you can see, you can use instruments for the code, and you can use our profiler for the uh, for memory allocations, and you have full UI uh, solutions from that perspective. So, when using instruments, did you get information about the C# -sharp call stacks, or? Yes, because what happens with the Mono on uh, on iOS is that we're we're not really a JIT compiler in that mode. Okay. On iOS, we're a static compiler. So, actually, you get full uh, you get a full method, like for example, system collections hash table add. So, you will actually get. Uh, the actual uh, method name, and you'll get the actual assembly code that was generated. Uh, so there's no interpreter; it's just just pure native raw code. That sounds pretty good. So another question for you, Miguel: um, How do you deal with async calls and saving game states? How does basically how does async interact with serialization? Yeah, uh, that is a very good question. I would say that this is an open uh, that is an open issue. Uh, you would have to you would have to deal that. Uh, uh, it, it's it would have to be part of your own solution. So, for example, uh, if your object is keeping uh, track of that state, you would need to serialize the state of, of that particular object. Uh, the good news is that since you're in control of the scheduler, uh, if you were to save the state of your game. What you can do is basically stop the scheduler, basically stop dispatching any async calls, and then save the state of all of your objects. Um, now, the only thing that you might not be able to save in that case is uh, is all of the state that is stored in the uh, in the stack frame. So that is a little bit of a problem. Uh, so I would say, if you need to serialize anything, you would need to manually make sure that uh, that you copy the values to your instance variables, because otherwise they're treated as uh, stack allocated variables.